Poutine. Is this game Canadian? Okay, video's canceled. We all have a lot of extra time right now. I'm not gonna say why, because if I do, YouTube's AI Overmind will make sure I don't get nearly as many views as I usually do, and I really just can't afford to lose any of my overwhelming success. If you're watching this from the future, and you don't know what I mean, just Google what happened in February and March of 2020. The point is, now that I have all this extra time, I thought to myself, what is a game that I could do a video on that I otherwise probably wouldn't be able to genuinely devote the time to? The answer to that question was Outward. Outward has been sitting in my Steam library for a few months. I remember playing it for a couple hours and enjoying it, so I decided to give it a try now that I had time for such a long-winded game. And I'm very glad I did. We are going to take this video from the top and start from the title screen. You'll notice that the tutorial is its own separate game mode, which should give you a clue as to how fucked you're about to be. Outward is a fairly complex game by today's standards, so you should probably play through its tutorial first. You don't need to, and the game will provide some direction while you play it, but being exposed to all of the game's various survival crafting and combat mechanics ahead of time is definitely going to help. Honestly, I wish more games would just give you a completely separate tutorial like this, so the actual game part of the game doesn't need to stop and explain things every 30 seconds for the first 15 minutes of gameplay. The tutorial is good, which is something that almost never happens in a medium like video games, where the best tutorial is usually no tutorial. After you finish the tutorial and start a new game, the first thing you'll do is make a character. And no matter what you do, you're going to look like a freak from that animated adaption of The Hobbit, so I would suggest just trying to make your character look as much like Martin Freeman as possible in order to help with immersion. After you've made a character selection, you wake up on a beach after a shipwreck. You find your friend on the beach, who explains that you two are the only survivors, then you make your way over to your home village, where there is an angry mob demanding payment for your character's blood price. The way things work in this game society is, if you mess up bad enough or break a serious enough law, you need to pay a blood price. But not like a Game of Thrones blood price. It's called a blood price because it's a debt that you and all of your blood descendants are responsible for paying. The main character's grandmother did some dumb shit at some point in the past, so now he owes a blood price. You explain to the angry mob that you left the village to go get rich to pay your blood price, but that you lost everything in the shipwreck. Then the village matriarch shows up, disperses the crowd, and orders you to stop being such a narc and make a 150 silver payment on your debt within 5 days or you will lose your home. So if you're playing this game to forget about the bank foreclosing on your assets, maybe pick a different one. From here the game sets you free. You can pay this price or not, you can stay in this village or not, the entire world is open to you and you can go or do whatever or wherever you want. Of course there are quests that will point you in certain directions and give you certain rewards, but the questline and the storyline aren't really the point of Outward. 
Most of its storytelling is visual, and the main questline sucks and doesn't matter. You will need to finish the main questline eventually to unlock the end game, which I'll talk about later in this video, but you should prioritize exploration and side quests over the main story, especially since some side quests have time limits. The most and only important choice you will make as far as the storyline goes is which faction to join. There are three of them. The first is the Blue Chamber Collective, which you join by siding with the leader of your village, who offers to adopt you into her family and absolve you of your blood price. The second is the Heroic Kingdom, which you can join by siding with your shipwreck friend. It's very tempting to join him because he has a cool peg leg and a sweet hook hand. His offer basically boils down to, fuck this, the blood price is a scam, let's go hang out in a desert city and be libertarians. Your third choice is to side with your other village friend, who is leaving the village permanently to join the church and hang out with a floating swamp god. Each one of these factions will offer you a unique questline and unique rewards, but they also end more or less the same. Pick whichever one sounds good to you, it doesn't really matter. Now that we have the pointless story and quest system out of the way, we can start getting into all the stuff that's actually cool and good about Outward. Like freezing to death in the wilderness, shooting fireballs, or trying to sword fight a giant shrimp. I should probably cover the survival mechanics first, since the rest of the game more or less hangs off this idea. Outward has, at least in the context of video games, realistic survival mechanics. You need to sleep, eat, drink, watch out for diseases, and protect yourself from the weather to survive long enough in Outward to get anything done. If you don't sleep, your maximum health and stamina will keep dropping the more tired your character gets. There isn't much to this. You can sleep in a home you own, in an inn, or in a camp to restore your health and stamina or pass time. Drinking is also not very complicated. You get a water skin, and you drink water. Sometimes you need to boil the water to clean it. Eating is also simple. Catch some fish, pick some mushrooms, pick some berries, or find some crimp. Everybody loves crimp. Cooking gets a little bit more interesting. You can either cook a single ingredient over a campfire or use a cooking pot to cook recipes with up to four ingredients. More complicated foods can also offer buffs and other positive effects like health regeneration. The system is extremely far from being unique, and the game isn't shy about telling you that it basically stole the entire idea. The alchemy system also functions identically to the cooking system, but for potions instead of food. The interesting thing about both of these two systems, and the entire crafting system in general, is that you can guess recipes and get access to them that way, instead of having to find a recipe out in the wild, or buy one from an NPC. If you mess around in your crafting inventory, your cooking inventory, or your alchemy inventory long enough, you might be able to find some good recipes early in the game, or if you're playing the game a second time and you just remember them all, you can get access to recipes just from memory alone. Some of these recipes are a little bullshit though, so I'm not sure how many you could realistically guess. This is a fire rag, which you can use to set your weapon on fire and make it do fire damage. Its recipe is oil and cloth. Okay, so that makes sense. It's just an oil-soaked towel. This is an ice rag, which does the same thing, but for cold damage. Let's try to look through our items and guess what makes this. Is it a cold stone and cloth? Nope, it's seaweed. Nothing about seaweed in terms of its item description, the sunny beaches you find it on, or literally any conventional knowledge about seaweed, both in reality or in popular culture, would make you guess it had anything to do with cold damage. I mean, the developers of this game are Canadian, so maybe there is some obscure piece of Quebecan folklore about how seaweed is blessed by an ice wizard, but unless that's the case, I have no clue how I would figure this out other than trying to combine every item I have with a cloth to see what happens. But I suppose the beauty is that you can do that if you want, as long as you don't mind wasting a lot of your resources to make a frosty shamwow. The crafting, cooking, and alchemy systems are basically the same borderline plagiarized system, and sometimes the recipes are stupid and unintuitive, but it's fun either way and makes you think about how to best manage your resources, many of which, like food items and herbs, 
will rot away over time, so you need to figure out how to either cook them or put them in a potion before they go to waste. A lot of people dislike survival mechanics. They will ask, what does it really add to the game that I have to eat food every 20 minutes to make a bar go up? And to this fair question I say, it adds nothing to the gameplay, but it does add a certain ambiance and atmosphere to a game. Playing as a character that needs to eat and sleep makes you feel like you're participating in a living world and not just a gamified version of a world. And in a game like Outward, where a large portion of your playthrough is walking through the game world, it better feel living. This game has a lot of walking. Some might say an intolerable amount of walking. We will visit the walking again soon. For now, let's move on to combat. Combat in Outward is one of the two most whined about things in this game's few overtly negative reviews. Is it a clunky fucked up version of Souls combat? Yes. Is it saved by its equally fucked up and clunky skill and magic system? Absolutely. Now, I need to explain how skills and magic work in this game so that you can understand why combat would be something approximating an embarrassment without them. The game has no experience or stat progression in it at all. You don't gain levels, you don't put points into strength or intelligence or something. All of your progress is based on finding better items and training skills. There are two kinds of trainers in the game. Sometimes a random NPC will offer you a single skill for 50 silver. Sometimes you'll find an NPC trainer like this one that gives you access to a skill tree that you have to pay silver to unlock. The way these skill trees work is anything on the lower half of the tree can be bought by any character, but only characters that unlock this center passive can unlock the upper half. The center passive skill costs one breakthrough point. Every character in the game only starts with three of these points. So while you can learn a huge number of skills without spending points, you can only pick three skill trees to fully unlock. Skills do a wide range of things from giving you buffs to your basic attacks, letting you eat ghosts to restore mana, or turning your lantern into a flamethrower. The other half of the skill system is the magic system, which is one of the best I've ever seen in a game. No character starts with mana. In order to get mana and be able to use skills that require it, you need to go to the ley line and hang out with cave wizards. In my playthrough, I tried to make it to the ley line, got taken prisoner by bandits, escaped by jumping down this hole, which resulted in losing all of my items. Then I spent that whole summer as a humble fisherman until I could afford the best equipment the town blacksmith could make. Then I tried climbing the mountain to get to the ley line during the winter and froze to death. I made the trip again, better prepared this time, fought the giant rock mantis on top of the mountain only to find out that the quest actually wanted me to go inside of the mountain, which then required me to navigate a trap-filled cave full of troglodytes. When I found the ley line, I had to permanently sacrifice some of my health and stamina in exchange for mana, and this was all just for the luxury of having a mana bar. If you want spells, you better cough up the silver. This isn't a charity. After you've sacrificed your life force to the cave laser, you can start using mana to cast spells you've bought. But it isn't as simple as just pressing F to throw Fireball. If you want to cast something like Fireball, you have a couple of options. The first is by using this spell, Spark. Normally Spark does nothing except for light campfires, but if you cast Fire Sigil first, and then cast Spark, it will result in a Fireball. Alternatively, you can buy the Elemental Discharge spell. Elemental Discharge will let you shoot a fireball from your weapon if it has a fire infusion. You can get a fire infusion from the infuse fire skill, a fire reg, or a fire varnish potion. Infuse fire also requires that the player have warm boon active, which you can get from a spell, from food, or from a potion. So as you can see here, you can't just cast a spell. Most of them require two or more steps before they start to function, and you'll probably need to use food or potions to really reach your full potential. This isn't even mentioning rune magic, which involves casting four different rune words in two or four word combinations to get desired effects. 
I just dumped a ton of rambling information on you, so let's ground all of that in an example about how this looked in my playthrough. I played a melee caster hybrid, and before a big fight, I would cast Discipline, which gave me the Discipline boon, which increased my physical damage. Then I would cast Rage, which gave me the Rage boon, which is required to use some other skills. Then I would cast Warm, which gave me the Warn boon that increases fire damage. Next, I would cast Infuse Fire, which adds fire damage to my weapon, but consumes the Warm boon. Then I drank a Warm potion to get the Warm boon back. Then I would cast Fire Sigil, which does nothing on its own, but then I would cast Mana Ward, which normally would make you immune to damage for 4 seconds, but because I casted it on top of a Fire Vigil, it would give me the Immolate effect instead, which increases fire damage, but burns your health over time. Finally, I would cast two specific Rune Words in a row to cast Runic Protection and take less damage. Now during the fight, I would use melee attacks, elemental discharge to throw fireballs with my main hand, and then use my offhand weapon to cast the strongest spell in the game, Gun. As you can see here, there is a lot of moving parts and a lot of ways you can theoretically build your own playstyle. You could choose never to get mana and just try to break the melee combat system by stacking as many buffs on yourself as possible. You could go full on wizard and hold a book in your offhand like a fucking nerd. You could decide to play a stealthy character and use traps and backstabs. You could snipe your way through the game with a bow, or you could do something insane, like putting 8 flintlock pistols in your inventory, loading them all separately, setting them to all 8 of your quick slot buttons, and just gunning your way through the game. There's also chakrams, I don't even know what these do. Or you can put together any combination of all of this stuff you want. Maybe you want to do an alchemist challenge run where you exclusively use potions for buffs and never actually use any spells. The possibilities are all over the place, and it more than makes up for the game's clunky execution. Yes, the combat feels like it's happening in a pool of jello. Yes, the skill system is a little unresponsive but it doesn't matter because of the sheer level of freedom you have to play the game in whatever way you want. The only real problem I had with the skill system is that the game only gives you two sets of quick slots, likely because this game was developed for consoles. I think adding a third set of quick slots for a total of 12 would have been better. You still could have rotated through three of them with the trigger buttons on a controller pretty easily, and this game has too much going on for just eight buttons especially since you're basically required to have one of them be a healing spell or item, which more or less leaves you with seven. On top of coming up with whatever playstyle you want, you can also go wherever you want, and you are heavily incentivized to do so. The main questline in this game is boring, and the reason it's boring is that it's not the point. The point of the game is exploring the world and coming up with your own objectives. One of the first things you'll notice when you open the map in this game is that it doesn't function like most video game maps. There are points of interest you can see, but there is no map marker that indicates where the player actually is. This means that in order to navigate the world, you need to actually read the map, paying attention to where roads are, where important landmarks are, and the actual topography of the terrain. At first, this can feel frustrating, but this eventually forces you to learn the layout of each area to the point where you can easily navigate without even using the map at all. This is significantly more satisfying than just mindlessly going in the direction you're pointed to by map markers. While you're exploring the world, you'll notice a couple things. 
The first being that usually each point of interest on a map will include some sort of dungeon or puzzle. The second is that most of these dungeons and puzzles will result in you finding one of these ornate chests. These chests are the real goals of Outward. They are where you will get most of your silver and a lot of weapon and armor upgrades. These dungeons also reset after 7 days of in-game time, so you can always revisit dungeons you've already cleared for some extra items to sell off if you're low on silver. The next thing you'll eventually figure out is that these points of interest that are marked on the map aren't really all of them. There are a few unmarked secret dungeons in every area, so you don't want to only follow what you see on the map. You want to go off and search the corners of the world on your own to see what you can dig up. There's also a lot of pretty incredible level design in these dungeons. Most dungeons in Outward aren't just a matter of going in, killing enemies, grabbing the chest, and leaving. Some are, but others have puzzles of varying complexity. The layout of some of these dungeons can also be pretty labyrinthine, and since you have no map marker to help you, you really need to pay attention and try to map it out on your own as you go. You're going to find a lot of hidden levers that open hidden doors, and there's probably going to be at least a few puzzles you never figure out unless you wiggy them. These dungeons almost feel like classic Doom levels, where you just find a button on a wall somewhere and then have to retrace your steps and figure out what the fuck it actually did. If you like this kind of mysterious level design, then you're gonna love dungeon crawling and outward. Exploring and solving puzzles in dungeons is also how you find a lot of the game's artifact weapons, which are some of the strongest in the game, and really makes you want to hunt for secrets even more. While you explore, you will also find a handful of unique enemies. Unique enemies almost always drop a powerful item, so if you see an enemy that looks weird, it's on sight. All of this incentive to explore combined with the game's survival mechanics and the fact that there is absolutely no fast travel system can make exploration very rewarding, but also a little tedious. Outward involves a lot of walking, sometimes in upwards of 10 to 20 minutes of walking, depending on how far away you need to go. Most of the time this didn't bother me much because the game's environments are nice to look at, the soundtrack is pretty good, and you can usually distract yourself from the hike by fighting some bandits or grabbing a couple ornate chests on your way to your destination. The game is called Outward. The entire point is to actually go outward. That being said, there were times where it seemed a little bit overbearing, and I could imagine a lot of people being put off by this. This is one of the most common complaints you see in bad reviews. I think there could have been some way of balancing this out a little bit better. Being able to fast travel between certain towns and outward would have been possible without taking away from the core experience of traveling. The game's world is split into four separate regions, and in order to travel to a new region, you need to get to one of these travel gates and pay travel rations to go to the next area. I think a system that charged you a high number of travel rations to move from town to town would have been alright, or at the very least, an option to allow you to fast travel to the city Berg, which has a fairly central location on the map. The last pieces of game design I want to talk about are this game's end game and its new game plus system. Once you finish the main quest line, you unlock 12 secret boss fights across the entire game world. If you want to find all of these on your own, you're going to need to explore the entire world again to find them, as well as pay the one-time payment to enter the boss arena. It's a great idea for an end game in a game all about searching for secrets, and some of these fights are pretty challenging. As far as New Game Plus goes, over the course of the game, you'll probably find some of these legacy chests. There are four legacy chests total, and when you start a new character, you can select their legacy, then select another one of your characters, and any of the items that the legacy character left in the legacy chests, the new character will then be able to pick up in their playthrough. Legacy chests can also upgrade the items left behind in them, which will turn them into items that you can only get via a legacy chest. This means that when you start a new character, you can not only look forward to maybe doing a different faction or a completely different playstyle, but also getting items that you can never get in the first playthrough of the game. This is a great way to incentivize replayability in a game that already had a pretty high amount of replayability. These are more or less all of my notes on game design. 
Outward does have its flaws. Like I mentioned before, the combat can feel soupy, the controls will disagree with you occasionally, and you will be walking more than the proclaimers. But the sheer level of freedom and mystery the game provides you with is, in my opinion, more than enough to make up for these issues. And these problems are lessened even more if you're playing with a friend through the co-op system. Just make sure if you want to play multiplayer, you're playing local multiplayer with the game's split-screen mode and not the online option. This game's online multiplayer is very weird, and only one player can save progress. There are some workarounds, but this game is very clearly designed to be a couch co-op experience. Now that we have covered Outward's game stuff, let's move on to its art stuff. I'm going to go over the environments first because they are one of Outward's major features, especially once you consider how much time is spent walking through them. Each of the four areas in the game are extremely different with completely different color palettes, terrain, and enemies. In the first area, Charancy... Charance... Is this... Is this French? Charancy's has mild summers and extremely cold winters, which will rotate between each other after some in-game time. The weather transition between summer and winter is very well done. Once it starts to snow, you can watch the snow slowly cover the ground as the shaders for the terrain and all the plants slowly shift from summer to winter. Once winter has fully taken over, this area looks and plays completely differently as you start to need to worry about keeping your body temperature up. The forest region is a vibrantly colored plain with giant hornet's nests and bioluminescent deer, the desert is a desert, and the swamp features giant lotus plants and looming temples. Every area in the game just feels cool to be in, which is something that needed to happen to make travel in this game tolerable. Sometimes you will see bandits hunting animals, or predators hunting other animals as you travel, which makes the world feel that much more alive. A lot of people complained about outward feeling empty, and it is to some extent empty, but it feels like an intentional emptiness. When I'm walking around on a huge beach in Outward, and I see a giant shrimp in the distance, this is sort of like if I was walking around outside and saw a bear. I see it, and it immediately stands out against its surroundings, and I have to think, great, is this going to be a problem? It adds a certain level of realism to the game's world that I think was probably intentional on the part of the developers. Where some people might see this and say the game world is empty and there aren't enough events, I would say that the game world is empty to make the events and the discoveries a little bit more rarefied and exciting. This is definitely a balancing act and maybe Outward falls a little bit too close to the empty side of the spectrum, but I enjoyed the atmosphere it created. Inside dungeons also have great environmental design, ranging from caves with odd gems and mushrooms to desert ruins full of ancient statues buried by the sand. This game has some amazing set pieces, and it's clear that most of this game's dungeons were meticulously planned and a lot of work was put into the assets required to put them together. Outward also uses these set pieces to put together great pieces of visual storytelling. You can tell by the way the desert is shaped, and by the ancient abandoned docks and the sand sharks, that it used to be an ocean. You can tell by the weird advanced tech in the ruins that the civilization that lived around this ocean was highly advanced. Many NPCs mention an event called the Scourge, which is explained to you almost entirely through visuals. Every area has one of these massive vigil towers, and surrounding the vigil towers you'll find the corpses of these monsters full of spears and swords and these destroyed golems. You can tell there was a large conflict fought over the vigils, and they are clearly very important to how the game world functions. This is even done on a micro level in some dungeons. For example, there's an undead enemy in Outward called a Burning Man. It's a fire zombie, nothing that special. But in this swamp ruin, you can hit a lever that will purify the swamp water flooding the ruins so that you can move through it without getting poisoned. If you explore the area after pulling this lever, you will find that the water was purified by using Burning Men to boil the water. The game doesn't explain this to you, you just need to pay attention. And there are many more moments like this in Outward. It's how most of the game's narrative information is passed to the player. 
I've been pretty clear about this being my preferred method of delivering story in video games. Writing is fine, but video games are a visual medium, and Outward understands this very well. Character design is also fantastic in Outward. This game has some of the most unique monster designs I've ever seen. Rather than going through all of them, I'll just show you one of my favorites. In the desert and in the forest regions of the game, you can find these gigantic hornet's nests. And around these areas, you can find an undead enemy called a living hive, which is a beehive grafted onto a human skeleton that seems to be controlling it somehow. You can even walk around and see more of them growing. It's a very weird and creative enemy, and this game is full of those. Obviously, the most important part of character design to the player is probably going to be the weapons and armor, which Outward also completely dominates. Almost every armor set in the game, from the starting padded armors and half-plate, all the way up to the more ornate endgame armors, look fantastic. If you're the kind of person that plays games like Dark Souls as a fashion simulator and loves to try to collect every armor piece in the game to create the perfect outfit for your big night out with the girls, you're really going to enjoy Outward's armor design. So that basically covers Outward. It's a great survival RPG that is completely unapologetic in its design choices. It's very rewarding, despite being frustrating at times, and I think if you enjoy hardcore role-playing games, you'll enjoy Outward. It even has a hardcore mode for real psychos, which enables a 20% chance of permanent death every time you die. It's the perfect game to buy right now if you want to kill all the free time we currently have with a couch co-op game with your quarantine buddy. Definitely make sure you enable debug mode though, because you're probably going to need it at least once. You can do this by putting a text file named debug.txt in this folder. If you want to see more videos like this one, consider subscribing. You should also follow me on Twitter so you don't miss any important updates. Leaving a like and a comment also really helps out. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.